Okay, so as I mentioned, I, I am going to try to follow as closely as I can with, with Feynman's treatment of this. And um, the, the couple things I'm not going to get into, which uh, this is why I would like for everyone to kind of go through and um, uh, spend some time looking into the details more. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to develop the, the mathematics. Um, specifically, we're going to see instances of of interference patterns, and um, these can be very very easily represented by um, uh, uh, cosine or sine or, or or various different mathematical functions that have. For example, an uh, amplitude, and within that amplitude, there's going to be a periodicity. That's that. Very, so we'll see it. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna develop mathematics. So I would specifically like for people to um, go through and see where that sinusoidal varying amplitude pattern comes from in, in the proper development of this. Uh, I am going to focus on the qualitative and, and like the actual results that would happen, and because that's where the, the heart of quantum mechanics comes in. So um, here's the here's the experimental setup, and to be clear, this is to some extent a, 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 another example of a Gadokin experiment or, or a thought experiment. However, all of this has absolutely been experimentally verified. So so I'm not going to necessarily attribute any single experiment or, or experimenter with the results, but understand that the simplified version you'll see has been confirmed in a lab. So here's the setup. We have some source, whether it's a, uh, and we're going to consider a couple different sources here, but I'll just generically write a source here, and I'll just call it S for now. And that source is going to produce some variety of, I don't want to call it signal, but something that propagates forward. And so specifically, we'll consider a couple different things. We'll consider like a gun where you shoot bullets. We'll consider an electron gun. We'll consider a, a, a laser or, or a light, um, we'll consider like a water wave uh, source and then a, a light wave source. And so whatever it is, it's outputting something moving right. Now we have a detector screen way back here. And this detector screen detects stuff. Uh, more precisely, it, it's built to detect very precisely where, where whatever is coming from the source lands on the right-hand side. So in the case of bullets, obviously, um, it will just have, you know, bullet holes or, or, you know, whatever those bullets are, you know, stacked up. And we can very clearly see whatever it is where each of those things lands here. So we'll see the spatial distribution where things line up. But in between those two, we have a... Uh, a barrier. And specifically this barrier is, those are the two straightest parallel lines I've ever drawn. Um, specifically, this barrier is a hard barrier except for two very narrow, relatively nearby slits. And that's where the name, the, the double slit experiment comes from. So these things here allow for whatever is being emitted by the source to pass through. And so that's why we can, in theory, detect things here on this screen. Now, um, yeah, I'm going to space them slightly further apart uh, just to kind of get a feel for how this goes. There and there. It'll work a little better. And it's, it's actually important in an experimental setting. It is very important to make these as narrow as possible, still allowing for at least some penetration from whatever is going from the source to the detector. Um, for example, in, you know, if you're shooting bullets at a screen, you want, these, you want these holes to be very slightly larger than the bullets. But if you were to make these larger and larger, at this point, the effects we would see would go away because it's not so much two slits as just two big, big, huge doors that you can walk through. So we're, we're going to do a pattern of experiments now. And the first one that we're going to do is we are literally going to consider a gun and bullets. And imagine that we are an incredibly poor shot, and so it's just like, 
just, we're just shooting the bullets all over. So we're not trying to aim at anything. We're just trying to distribute these bullets as, as arbitrarily as we can. Um, and I wish I could click and drag that down about one inch. We want to fire the bullets more or less at the midpoint here. So what we're going to find, I mean, it doesn't take much of a, a, a rocket surgeon to figure it out. Uh, what you're going to find is that at the detector screen, the results we're going to get, and actually let me do it like this, item A, bullets. And I'm just going to kind of, well, I guess I will redraw this a little bit. There's the gun, here's the screen, here's the detector. And I, I hope you can see those, actually they're rare. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the bullets that will arrive at the detector here are going to be essentially a, a, a bimodal distribution here. And what I mean by that is simply half the, you know, half the bullets that are going to go through this wall are going to go through this route there. The other half are going to go through that route there. And so the exact pattern or the exact intensity pattern specifically that we see on the detector is going to look like this. You have nothing in the middle at all because nothing can pass through that wall. And you have a very steep spike right there and a very steep spike right there. Let me try that again. Yeah, that looks better. Now, the, the tighter you make those slits, obviously, the narrower those, those um, spikes become. But generally speaking, though, this is exactly the pattern that we get when you are dealing with particles. So bullets, you know, billiard balls, um, individual atoms that, that you fling, whatever. So this is a particle like distribution. And again, I, I think this is just entirely obvious that if you see something like this, you know whatever you have just shot out behaves like a particle. So, again, when I say particle-like behavior, what I, what I very precisely mean is that when you do this experiment, you get a result that looks essentially the same like this. So, you know, that, that, that's kind of the easy case. And this is something that you could predict as a third grader. Let's consider now, instead of a gun, let's now imagine that we are in water. And we have some kid that's just like splashing up and down and just producing like a, a continuous series of waves that are propagating outwards. So now we have some water waves, which these water waves are going to propagate outwards. We have a series of spherical wave fronts. And once they hit the detector, um, if you've ever seen animation, it's actually really, it's like almost hip hypnotic to see the, the reflection of these waves. So the, the wave fronts that impact the, the barrier here, not at the slits, simply just reflect back. And you get basically that whole pattern repeating backwards. And that's where you get a really cool kind of um, interference pattern where, where there's all of these like, you know, it's a two dimensional distribution of, you know, like cancelizations and, and um, well, destructive and constructive interference. And it, it's a really cool pattern if, if you watch it. I'm not going to try to animate that here. But the little sections of the wave fronts that do in fact pass through those slits, now each of those slits emulates a brand new source. So I'll try to draw it like that. So the, the, wave, the wave fronts that pass through that upper slit now create a pattern. I'm going to use a slightly... I'm going to color coordinate this. The wave fronts that pass through the upper slit produce the blue pattern here. And I'll space it out a little more. And then equally, the waves, the, the parts of the wave front that pass through the lower slit produce an equivalent wave front pattern like this.
So it's it's tough to like show this on a blackboard, but the point or a whiteboard, or whatever. But each of these wave crests can and will interact with the wave crests from the other slit. So specifically at the at the points where the waves the the the, the crests coincide, you have constructive interference right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, and so on. The points where you have uh, I'll do it in black. The points where you have one wave maximum coinciding with the other wave's minimum, you get destructive interference. So that might happen, for example, right here, halfway between those two peaks. It might happen right here, halfway between those two, right there, right here, right here. So where that green wave is at a maximum, we're at a minimum between those blue wave fronts. And I don't know how easily that appears on the screen, but the whole point is we have a, a, a pattern. And actually, it's a, um, if I was an artist at all, I could do this better, obviously. But uh, you, you have a, a pretty geometric and symmetrical pattern where these, the, the, the constructive and destructive patterns form a really cool well, pattern. And the result, I'll draw it over here on the right. And then I'm just going to kind of, I'm not even going to attempt that here. It's actually, that's a bad way to notate that. Anyway, the whole point is that we just have a whole bunch of crap that does this. And in the end, the important thing is that the eventual pattern that we see at the detector forms a very well-defined, uh, and, and a mathematically well-defined, I mean, a series of, at the center, directly between these two slits, if we make a, a midpoint here. At the center, we have a maximum amplitude of the entire thing. And then pretty rapidly it drops to zero because at this point here and at that point there, we have destructive interference. Here we have constructive interference. So the waves add together and then pretty rapidly they cancel out and then they add together again shortly after, but not as, with, with a lower intensity, I should say. So the waves coming from here are stronger, but the waves coming from here have a little bit lower amplitude. So we get a secondary peak that's a little bit lower than the primary one. And the same thing occurs just below it, where the waves from the bottom are at a maximum, the waves from the top are a little bit lower amplitude. And then we have a tertiary, tertiary peak, uh, quaternary peak, and I don't know if those are actually the proper names, but it produces a, a interference pattern. And this is what I was saying where there's, where, oh shoot. Uh, I'll get that later. Okay, um, anyway, it forms an interference pattern where there's a very well-defined series of peaks and troughs. And, um, And we can view this as, I'm not gonna draw it here, but there's kind of a amplitude function where it's almost, actually I will draw it a little bit. Where it's, um, there's a line where it tells where the maximum will be. And then within that, there is a sinusoidal function that drops between zero and the max amplitude. So whenever you see a result that looks like this, this is what we call wave-like. And the wave-like pattern tells us that whatever that source is behaves like a wave. I mean, that's obvious. So basically, these are the, um, the, the, the two basic results. There, there is, we can either get one or the other. When you pass stuff through the slits, if you see a pattern that looks like this, 
we can interpret that whatever that source was was spitting out particles. If you obtain a pattern that looks like this, we can assume that whatever that source was was emitting things that behave like waves. So these are our two options, and there's really nothing in between, like experimentally or, you know, like theoretically. So now we're going to go through and test these with a little bit more, um, we're going to try some different, a different setup here. 